Well, good morning, everybody. Do you know, it's an amazing thing to me, and one of those constant joys that, following the lectionary, as I usually do, I find that sometimes three very different readings from very different sections of the Bible, which at first reading had me absolutely scratching my head to see any connection whatsoever, that after a while, the theme starts to emerge and makes sense. Faced with the task of exploring the fourth chapter of John's first letter with you, I confess that I felt very daunted, maybe even a little bit afraid. You see, I do love John's first letter. And I've used it quite a lot in my preaching, and I know it quite well. But what for me makes it quite un easy to understand the message that lies underneath it and runs all through it is that John says the same thing over and over and over again, but in slightly different ways. It's a very effective way to hammer home a message. But you've already had three chapters about love. So what can I find that's going to be different? Well, I gave up trying and this is what you're getting. It is all about love and a very special love at that. At the heart of this letter, and I am pleased to state, in verses 8 and 16 of chapter 4, is the deceptively simple message, God is love. But what do we mean by love? And what does John mean by love? And what does God mean by love? How do we speak about God? And what does it really mean to say God is love? Rather than he, she, they shows love towards us. Because those things are very different. Thanks to C.S. Lewis... He wrote a book in 1960 called The Four Loves. It, in, and in that, he expounds on the fact that there are at least four different kinds of love referred to in the New Testament, which in the Greek each have their own word with a very specific meaning, which in the English language we lump together and translate them all as love. What did the Beatles mean by love? I wonder. I might suggest that it might be something different than we mean by love. But if you want to learn more about these four different loves in depth, I can recommend the YouTube video clip, which is shown, um, the URL is shown there. Uh, it's actually C.S. Lewis speaking with, I don't know if you've ever seen any of the Doodle videos, but something very clever doodles away and illustrates what's being said. It lasts for 22 minutes. I suppose I could just have shown that this morning. There's a thought. Now, I'm no Greek scholar, so please forgive my attempts at pronunciation as we look at these four words. When I Google it to see how it should be pronounced, I get different interpretations. So this is mine, of how it's pronounced, I mean, not of what it is. Storge is the affection or empathy, that special bond that exists within a family, between a mother and son, between a father and daughter, between a brother and sister. It's a sort of glue that holds a family together. The second one, philia, 
is defined as the love that exists between friends, that close friendship that is a very special bond. Eros, which I think we all probably know what that means, isn't actually used in the New Testament, but it is alluded to. And it's best translated as sexual passion. And finally, number four, agape. Unconditional, universal love. What they all have in common is that of very nature, they are re relational. We can't love without entering into a relationship with someone or something other than ourselves. With all the vulnerability and the risk that a relationship implies. God loves us and invites us to love him. To take that risk. And what a risk. In all John's writings, we're told that he uses the noun agape 30 times in total. In 25 different verses. Now, eight of these verses are found in 1 John chapter 4. Now, if my maths are correct, where's he gone? That's a, a, just over a quarter, is that right? I've lost him. Oh, there, thank you. I always have to check with Dave when I'm into maths. Agape is defined as that generous, self-giving love. Love that wants only the good of the other person. That's all. And asks nothing in return. Love of the kind demonstrated by God's giving of his own life in Jesus for the life of the world. Agape love is not just an attribute of God, but the very essence of God's being. Love is shown to be the very reason that creation exists, the very existence of God. They're one and the same. They can't exist without the other. But agape love is essentially practical. It's love shown in action. It's the love described by Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, that well-known description of love. And perhaps we could try substituting God's name into that reading to find out a bit more about God. But the challenge to us as Christians is to try substituting our name into there and see how well we fit too. So with all that in mind, we begin our exploration of 1 John chapter 4. And this is where my initial allusion to the lectionary comes in because coincidentally, or is it God incidentally, Today's lectionary gospel gives us a little glimpse of the author John as a young man in action. And I'm going to read it to you from the message. John spoke up, teacher, we saw a man using your name to expel demons and we stopped him because he wasn't in our group. Jesus wasn't pleased. Don't stop him. No one can use my name to do something good and powerful. And in the next breath, cut me down. If he's not an enemy, he's an ally. Why, anyone by just giving you a cup of water in my name is on our side. Count on it that God will notice. On the other hand, 
if you give one of these simple childlike believers a hard time, bullying, or taking advantage of their simple trust, you'll soon wish you hadn't. You'd be better off dropped in the middle of the lake with a millstone around your neck. In this short passage, we're reminded that God's spirit is offered to all. It isn't the possession of any of us. It's God's spirit. The power of God's transforming love has no boundaries and is at work in all things. Jesus teaches John that his healing power is not only for his close followers and that God's power is not limited by the rules and authority that the disciples may want to set upon it. For disciples read church. The spirit will blow wherever it likes. Jesus also reminds his disciples of their need to care for the least powerful in our society and not let their actions cause harm to anyone. This is a message which speaks powerfully to our times. I have, on, I must admit, quite rare occasions taken part in street mission. And one of the things that has struck me each time as I've talked to people in the street is how many of them have been hurt by their association with the church and have decided to walk away because of that. Not from God, but from the structure of the church. We have a responsibility to be careful and to think and to use love in all things. Who knows what influence this incident had on John as he wrote his letter so many years ago. The message begins 1 John chapter 4, and you've all heard it read, with these words, don't believe everything you hear. What a word for our time. My friends, don't believe everything you hear. Carefully weigh and examine what people tell you. Not everyone who talks about God comes from God. There's a lot of lying preachers loose in the world. False news is everywhere. So how do we discern the truth? The image on the screen was shared by, face, by a Facebook friend, a retired minister in the United Methodist Church in the States. And it certainly made me stop and think. When I saw it, it had already received over 26,000 likes and 36,000 shares. I didn't read all the thousands of comments that were attached to it, but I did look at some of them. And one of them struck in my mind. It was a comment from a lady who was obviously very, very concerned. She wrote, this is just part of it, the division is so huge and hateful, it's getting harder to distinguish between right and wrong. Political parties were never an issue between good friends. And now friends are no longer friends because they mistakenly started a conversation. It's beyond sad. It's so divided and extreme. Who out there hasn't experienced this? I don't know if any of you follow our president of Methodist Conference, Michaela Youngson's uh, blog, but it's worth following. She uh, attended the prayer meeting at the Labour Party conference on Monday and blogged about it, what she'd shared there. And it contained this bit. George Orwell wrote that in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth 
becomes a re revolutionary act. Those words ring truer today than when Orwell imagined a dystopian future, as he wrote 1984 in the last months of the Second World War. So how do we discern what's right? You know, John in his letter points us time and time again back to Jesus. What would Jesus do? What did Jesus do? And he says, here's how you test for the genuine spirit of God. Everyone who confesses openly his faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came as an actual flesh and blood person, comes from God and belongs to God. You know, a confession of faith in God is so much more than lip service to an ideology. It's a living testimony to that personal relationship between God and the individual. When you come from God and belong to God, then the light of God's agape love shines through you and his guidance rules your conscience if you let it. John continues, my dear children, you come from God and you belong to God. You've already won a big victory over the false teachers, for the spirit in you is far stronger than anything in the world. But we've got to hang on to that. We've got to remember when we feel disheartened, when we feel as if everything's going wrong, that we know and love a God for whom nothing is impossible. Anyone who knows God understands us and listens. The person who has nothing to do with God will, of course, not listen to us. This is another test for telling the spirit of truth from the spirit of deception. So we think about that divine grace that God is love. And we're exhorted to continue to love one another and to express that love of God in our relationship with other people. We know how God showed his love for him, for us. He sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him not exist but live this is the kind of love that's being talked about here not that once upon a time we loved God but that first of all he loved us it didn't matter what we were doing where we were who we were he loved us and that love doesn't change it's a love with all the power of forgiveness, with all the perfection of love. And it's a love that we're called to emulate and share with other people. My dear, dear friends, writes John, if God loved us like this, we certainly ought to love one another. And that means everyone. If we love one another, God dwells deeply within us and his love becomes complete in us. How will the world know unless we show them what love truly is? This is how we know we're living steadily and deeply in him and he in us. He's given us life from his life, from his very own spirit. And I repeat, God's spirit is offered to all. The power of God's transforming love has no boundaries and is at work in all things.
So to love and be loved can be summed up in the term discipleship. This is what this letter is about. It's about how we should live our lives as followers of Christ. God is love. When we take up permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God and God lives in us. There is no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear. Since fear is a crippling, a fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment, fear of the future, fear of the past, fear of what might happen to our children. Love can overcome those fears. But to love in that relationship means we've got to trust God, no matter what happens or where we are, that he will see us through. It may not be what we choose, but, you know, a lot of people that I meet are frightened of dying. And a lot of the people that I meet would claim to be Christians who are frightened of dying. But what do we fear in death but united, being united with Christ and entering into eternal life? And if we can trust God with ourselves, then surely we can trust him with those we love too. When we look back at the gospel accounts of Jesus, we notice that the prevailing motivation for all that led up to Christ's crucifixion is fear. The Jewish authorities feared this itinerant preacher from a very small country village. They feared his ability to perform miracles. They feared his popularity with the crowds. They feared the way he was disputing what the tenants that they hold, held very precious of their religion. And most of all, perhaps, they were afraid that hints of the popular unrest would spark fear in the Roman occupying power, which in turn might prompt their removal from the power that they had to locally manage this rather insignificant corner of the Roman Empire. When authorities act on their fear, it's probably out of a determination to maintain their own power base. When the crowds lined the streets of Jerusalem, cut down branches to wave, and enthusiastically welcomed Jesus as king into their city, how that must have confirmed the fears of those who were in power. You see, the, the authorities were much more practiced at manipulating the crowds than paying any attention to public opinion. And they certainly showed how they could do that at Jesus' trial. And what about Peter too? Getting as near as he dared to Jesus, we can fear, feel his fear as his courage to stand with Jesus begins to desert him. I would argue that fear still remains the enemy of the gospel. Are we not witnessing on a frighteningly regular basis that the forces which cause the Jewish authorities to reject Jesus still haunt executive power in so many areas of our world, including the land that we once called holy. Fear of losing power seems to justify the most horrendous injustices. And in turn, this seems to create a fearful people, afraid to challenge the corporate madness. Thankfully, not all of them. 
But, you know, we're all a bit afraid of rejection, aren't we? We tend to hold back rather than take too many risks. Sometimes, perhaps, we worry too much about what other people will think. We choose not to do or say something because it's not considered to be the thing to do. It's not what others are doing, or more usually not doing. And we think people will shun us or think we're odd or laugh at us. So we don't speak up and we don't do something that really needs to be done because we think, well, it's not my job and we don't want to step on other people's toes, even if it's quite obvious that no one else is going to do anything. Love, on the other hand, rather than holding back, focuses on meeting a need, not on what people will think. Sometimes, I think, we worry too much about causing offence. Tom Wright suggests that being nice to everybody, seeking reconciliation at any price, has to be balanced by naming and dealing with evil and reminds us that leaving vengeance to God, as Paul instructs in Romans 12, 19 to 21, was revolutionary when it was first written and it remains so today. But it doesn't mean denying that evil is real and that God hates it. On the 21st of March, 2008, the Church Times published a leader entitled, Only Perfect Love Can Cast Out Fear. When I read it 10 years ago, it struck lots of chords with me. And returning to it 10 years on, during the last couple of weeks, I confess it has influenced my thinking as I've prepared for today. I'd like just to read you the closing part of this article. Into this dark tangle shines the glory of the resurrection. It's easy to understand the fearfulness of Christian believers in the face of brutality, either political or corporate. But Christ's example can be the source of boldness in the face of discrimination. A well of courage when tyrants, little or big, need to be confronted. The purpose of the church is to nurture this fearlessness. And the neglect, or worse, of this function has been shameful, if understandable. First, it's hard, intimate work to persuade the faithful to allow the Holy Spirit to pervade new areas of their lives, their prejudices, their political opinions, their carefully guarded inadequacies. Second, challenging power, wherever it reposes, requires support. And few congregations are united enough to provide this in any measure. What an indictment. But I wonder how much has it changed in the last 10 years? If indeed we do believe that perfect love drives out fear, can I challenge each one of us to search our hearts for any fears that may be holding us back and to be brave enough to share those fears with a trusted friend and to welcome Christ's gift of courage into our lives and into the life of our churches? The President and Vice President of the Methodist Cho uh, Conference have chosen as their theme for this year of office, Radical Grace, Transforming Hope. And there are a few copies of these at the back if anybody's not already picked one up and would like to take one. And describes in the little bit underneath, joining in with God's longing for a world transformed by love. That's what God is longing for, I believe. 
In Monday's blog, Michaela continued, Christians have at times been criticized for praying for a better world whilst doing little to bring about transformation. And sometimes we have despaired of knowing what to do other than to pray in the face of complex systems that oppress the poor, systems of which we know we are a part and from which we find it impossible to extricate ourselves. Prayer seems like a last resort. All that's left to us, what else can we do? Like the disciples on the lake in a storm, we wait until the water is threatening to sink us before we turn to Christ in our fear and frustration. But she goes on, prayer is a revolutionary act because it is a declaration that we believe that change is possible. I remember, along with Michaela, all those years when we prayed for the end of apartheid in South Africa, for peace in Northern Ireland, for the Berlin Wall to come down, for Nelson Mandela's release. The list goes on. Who can say how many opinions were changed because of public prayer, year after year. How much did prayer contribute to the success of all these campaigns? It's not easy to measure, but our prayers were part of the picture, a statement of belief about the kind of world we want to live in and our faith that God can work through us to make it possible. Prayer is a revolutionary act, writes Michaela, because it declares that we are not merely individuals with our own views and needs, but that we join with a worldwide body connected to each other and connected through God. Prayer is a revolutionary act because it is an act of empathy when the assumption of many world leaders and most of the media is that the spirit of the age is everyone for themselves and let the devil take the hindmost. But empathy is the opposite. It recognizes the other. It values the other's needs and recognizes that God's heart is not with those who exploit the poor and vulnerable, but it, but it is with those spoken of by Jesus in Luke chapter 4, which has been described as his manifesto. God longs to draw to our attention the poor, the captive, the blind and the oppressed. To pray is the starting point of, the, of proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. Maybe a continuing point would be coming along next Tuesday to the fruitfulness course and hearing what we can do here in our own communities. Because we, though, are going to love, love and be loved. First we were loved, now we love. God loved us first. And there is a cost involved in loving. Just as Jesus gave himself for us, he calls us to follow his example and love with agape love, that generous, self-giving love that looks for no reward. Love that wants only the good of the other person. The Joint Public Issues team is made up of the Baptist Union, the Church of Scotland, the Methodist Church, and the United Ref Reformed Church, working together for peace and justice. They regularly issue statements. Part of their role is to sift through the news and try and discern what is truth and what is lies. On Tuesday, they issued a statement about the so-called hostile environment. We're told that the hostile environment is a web of government policies designed to make life so difficult for people 
who cannot prove they have the right to live in the UK, that they will choose to leave. As Christians, we don't believe that a system which deliberately inflicts destitution is the kind of system our world should be run by. If you agree with that statement, then I encourage you to find out more. See what action you may be called to take. And don't be afraid to speak out. And finally, I leave the last words to John. And these need no explanation. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing of it, he is a liar. If he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God he can't see? The command we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. Amen.